As a child, I used to use my record turntable not just to play music, but also to do little experiments. I'd put toys and different objects, action figures maybe, on the rim of the uh, record. And then as I hit the on switch and the record started to spin up to speed, um, I'd try to figure out how long it took before this object would go flying off tangentially. There are a couple different speed settings for LPs or full albums. The record spin at 33 revolutions per minute, and for singles, the record spins at 45 revolutions per minute. So here we're clearly not talking about a velocity measured in meters per second. Instead, we're talking about an angular velocity. Now that should be in radians per second, not revolutions per minute, but we can easily make a unit conversion for that. So here's a side view. Once in a while, I would put coins on the rim of the LP. So let's say that this is at a distance of about five inches, which would be about, we'll say, 13 centimeters um, from the center. So the question is, uh, what coefficient of friction would be required to allow the coin to spin at 33 RPM? So a free body diagram shows normal force mg, and then the friction force points inward, and that's it. Normal force and mg cancel each other out, so the friction force is the unbalanced remaining net amount of force. And friction, of course, is coefficient of friction multiplied by normal force. So we can substitute on both sides of the equation. Frictional force is ma, or I'm sorry, net force is ma, and the frictional force is mu times, we can replace n with mg. So mass cancels out. This acceleration is a centripetal acceleration, and it's got to be equal to mu g. Here's a top view of the same scenario, and the coin has a desire to continue traveling in a straight line. There's its tangential velocity. It actually goes around in a circular path with some angular speed thanks to a force of friction that points at a 90 degree angle relative to the tangential velocity. Now, you should recall that velocity in meters per second can be found by multiplying the angular speed in radians per second times the radius. So if centripetal acceleration can be found by uh, dividing speed squared by radius, then that equates to an equation that says we can find centripetal acceleration by multiplying angular speed squared times radius. So we can make that substitution into our work. And omega squared times r is equal to mu g. So the coefficient of friction would have to be equal to omega squared times r divided by g. So let's do a unit conversion, and we can plug in for this numerical example 33 revolutions per minute. We want to change that to radians per second. So let's get rid of revolutions and change it into radians. There are 6.28 radians in every revolution. And let's also cancel out minutes and change it to seconds. There are 60 seconds in every minute. So we'll be left with radians per second. So if we do 33 times 6.28, and divide that by 60, we can convert this to about 3.45 radians per second. Okay, so mu is equal to 3.45 radians per second, quantity squared, times a radius of, what did we say, 13 centimeters? Right, 0.13 meters divided by 9.8 meters per second squared. Radians are just a placeholder when it comes to units, so these seconds get squared and cancel with those seconds squared. In the end, we're just left with um, no units at all because the meters also cancel out. And so we get a value of mu that has to at least be equal to 
0 0.16. All right, so just one more example of uh, making free body diagrams and applying Newton's laws to the case of uniform circular motion. Now, we can um, add an extension to this problem and say, what if the coin on the turntable isn't just uh, centripetally accelerating? What if there's both a increase in speed and a change in direction. There certainly has to be a change in direction. You can't go in a circular path without having, at the very least, a centripetal component to the acceleration. If we take a look at the bird's eye view of this, we could. We, there has to be a centripetal component to the acceleration, but if it's increasing in speed, there's also a component to the acceleration. We'll call it a tangential acceleration. And so by our method of vector addition, if we use the parallelogram method, there'd be an overall acceleration that points at an angle like this. We can find the total acceleration by taking the square root of the centripetal acceleration squared plus the tangential acceleration squared. And so in this case, uh, it would require a, great, a larger amount of mu, right? a greater coefficient of friction than our calculated value of 0.16 because there would have to be a larger force to provide both a tangential and a centripetal acceleration. So I won't provide a numerical example here. You can find some of those um, in the assigned homework for this unit of study. But uh, just make note of the concept here that still boils down to the idea that net force has to equal mass times acceleration, and in this case, the acceleration would be the total acceleration found by this method. Uh, but the net force, um, again, would only be provided by a force of friction, which is mu times normal force. So um, you could proceed with these uh, outlined concepts if you come across a problem of this nature.